place. I have one quick announcement is my Bible study is taking a hiatus for the um, month of June. Uh, this month in August, we will begin afresh and again in September. Uh, the class decided to do that, to take a month off or two. And we're going to begin on the Gospel of Mark. So uh, um, put that on your calendars for September. <coughs> Do that. Uh, the special bulletin. Does anybody have the special bulletin today? <laughs> well, then I have our choral call to worship.
that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If anyone is in Jesus Christ, he, is a new, he or she is a new creation. The past is finished and gone, and all things are made fresh, and all things are made new. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. <laughs>
children, the cry of the baby. Oh God, open our eyes, we pray, to the beauty around us, within us, and with those surrounding us. Help us to always be a people who have a sense of wonder. sense of mystery for all you do for us and the people that you put in our path. This day we pray for all those on our prayer list for the needs expressed there. We pray for the doctors who are and the nurses and the therapists who are part of answered prayer for this prayer list and grateful for the healing arts that they practice. Today, though, oh God, we want to lift before your grace those who feel alone, those who feel abandoned, those who seem to have lost their way. Help us all to know, and especially men, that you walk with us and you, and you meet us at every street corner of our lives. That the truth is, even though we can't see you, sometimes, dear Lord, you're always there. Always ready to lift us up if we need to be. Help us never to forget that live in hope that no matter what comes our way, we are not alone. Dear Lord, there are many unspoken thoughts and prayers that perhaps lie on hearts in the congregation today, concerns that are private or, or within the family or in the, or in the workplace. We now Take moments of silence for us to present those prayers before your throne of grace. take all these prayers and we pray them in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who gives us the courage and the grace that we can dare approach our loving trying God with our prayers and remember the prayer that he taught us when he prayed our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name Honestly, many tend to 
agree with Martha in, in, this, in this story. Well, enough of that. You'll either like it or you won't. On with the sermon. Let us now, before we turn to the text and the sermon, turn to God in prayer. Eternal God, I pray that your spirit would descend upon this place with power. And that you would give to this old pastor the gift of preaching today. And we know that you will. For we pray with anticipation in the strong name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. This follows right after the parable of the Good Samaritan, which I will talk about in the sermon. But now let us reverently attend to the reading of God's holy word. Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him, welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all this work by myself? Tell them to, tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is only need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part which will not be taken away from her. This is the word of the Lord. In my years in the ministry, especially on my work on the committee on ministry for many years, one of the large concerns on the presbytery level for individual pastors is burnout. Concern that they get so consumed with their call, with their vocation, that they become frazzled, um, frustrated, uh, tearing their hair out because of all the many things that have to do in their life as a church, as a called minister. I never got that until about three or four years before I came to South Carolina. And after 12 years in the church where I had to do three worship services, had all sorts of issues with staff every once in a while, with associate pastors, Christian educators, some of the secretaries, having a session that had 26 members on it. You don't know how I love this church. <laughs> Our session meetings last 20 minutes. <laughs> it's a glorious thing for me. <laughs> because session meetings back then used to last for two to three hours. And the burden, of the burden after 2008 of financially struggling was hard to bear. And I became frustrated. I burned out. Ministry was no longer a joy to me. It was a chore. I don't think my vocation is much different than yours. I think burnout is true wherever we work or wherever we work. I grew up in a family filled with teachers and educators as well as ministers. Teachers can burn out. Can't. We know the truth of that. I think a teacher's favorite word is summer. <laughs> <laughs> and then 45-15 came all year for all of us. I think burnout is a possibility for all of us. A temptation for all of us. The reason why I bring this up is, and I'm reading into the text, I realize we only have a few verses here, but 
Martha seems to me to be burned out as we come here today. Usually when you're burned out, aren't you sort of ill-tempered a little bit? Aren't you sort of frustrated a little bit? Aren't you sort of ticked off when your little sister isn't helping with what she's supposed to do with hospitality in the Middle East and sitting there listening and you just blow up? I know I'm reading between the lines, but I think Martha's burning out. I think, but for whatever reason, and so this is why she has this, should we call it a blowout? Tantrum? I don't know. By the way, Jesus never says that what she was doing was wrong. She was actually doing what she was supposed to do. The laws of hospitality in the Middle East are very clear. She wasn't, she wasn't, doing anything that was not expected of her. In fact, you know the word they use for her busyness, for her hospitality, the Greek word for hospitality? Diakonos, where we get our word for deacons and service to others. That's where we get it. Luke uses it here on purpose. Jesus never says she's wrong, but what she, but what brings, what the text brings out is he sees that she is distracted. Now I don't know why the translators use that word. Or perhaps it's I don't know why because the better the the better translation of this is she was drawn away, drawn away. From what was best. The busyness distracted her so much that she was drawn away from what Mary was doing. I've been thinking about that all week. Isn't that a temptation for all of us when you get so busy, when you get burned out, when you get frustrated, when you just, your life seems up to here? You just get drawn away what's important. You get drawn away from what's most needed. I'll never forget that little one-line quote by Paul Saunders, the, the, men, the senator from Massachusetts when he was running for vice president when he was diagnosed with cancer. And he said, he reflected how he had spent so much time in his business and politics and so much time that took him away from his family. And in tears, he said, you know, though, I've never heard anyone tell anybody who's in my position that she didn't spend enough time in her business. Distracted. Drawn away. The most important. I think that's an issue in our culture more, in my, in this generation. I feel sorry for teenagers in this generation. I, they have all my empathy. When I was a teenager, I didn't know what a calendar was. I pretty much knew what I was going to do all week long. I didn't have appointments everywhere. I am stunned by the busyness that our young people have in today's culture. It's amazing to me. They all claim that in the computer age, because computers are going to do everything for us. Remember that? They're going to do everything. You know, they type for us. Have your lives been any less busy with computers? No. It's just not in words. I don't know why. Being distracted, being drawn away from that which is important. I always would counsel. In premarital counseling, marital counseling, and just general counseling, I always counsel how the fact that in our culture, we love to take care of our physical. Running, doing exercises, 
You know, if you go to any bookstore, you'll see shelves and shelves are on TV. All the exercise equipment. We, and that's good. I could do better than that. Right? <laughs> we love to take care of our physical self. And I think most people like to take care of their mental. Stimulate their mental capacity. Like to read novels. Like to stretch your mind a little bit. Like to learn a little bit about mathematics. We like to, to expand our horizons mentally. And that's good. Nothing wrong with that. But I gotta tell you, as a minister, developing, strengthening our spiritual life with God often has taken third place. I just want to be blunt about it. Being drawn away, being distracted. When I was a younger preacher, I used to stay away from stuff that might be controversial. I didn't want to be, you know, well, whatever. But today I'm not going to be. I've decided rather than being sensitive, I'm going to be blunt. If you find yourself in a position where you don't have time to pray, well then you're too busy and you're being drawn away. If you ever find yourself that you don't have time to feast on God's word and study from the Bible, then you're too busy. You're being drawn away. This one cuts close to the bone with me because it has to do with my own family. If you find yourself too busy to go to worship, I hope they watch it on YouTube. <laughs> too busy to go to worship, then you are too busy and you're being drawn away. Mary was distracted. She was drawn away from sitting at the feet and learning from the Lord. You know, there's an irony here. While Mary's feasting on the bread of life, while she's drinking the water as Jesus told the woman at the well that wells up to eternal life, her sister is all concerned with bread, regular bread. Now, Luke puts this little story right after the Good Samaritan. And these gospel writers, you know, I think Luke's a great writer. And remember, gospels are not biographies. They're written to the church using experiences from Jesus' life to deal with issues that are important to the people in the pews of that day. The great miracle is the issues that the people dealt with in that day are the same issues that we deal with today, which makes the gospel so powerful. I think Luke has given us an example of the great verse that was quoted. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The first story is about loving your neighbor as yourself. It's actually doing the work, not just sitting and doing nothing, not just living an uh, esoteric life, but actually doing something, doing the work of a disciple, loving your neighbor. Whereas Mary is a great example sitting at the feet of Jesus, feasting in the presence of the Savior, of loving God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Both are needed. Both are needed. That's why Luke put the parable of the Good Samaritan there. There's nothing wrong. There's everything.
Christian is right about doing the work of a Christian, doing the work of a mother, doing the work you were called to do, doing the work of a teacher, doing the work of a pastor, a doctor. You just put the vocation in there. Nothing wrong with that. It's needed. You need to do it. But you don't do it so much that you get distracted. You get drawn away from the other. It's the Word of God. It's our prayer life. It's our church life. It's perhaps you find it working in the garden you draw close to God. Perhaps, perhaps you find it when you're doing housework even. I don't know. Drawing close to God. I remember that scene in the movie Chariots of Fire. Now, I'm not a runner. My wife is. And she told me that when she ran, it was a spiritual thing for her. And I remember, you remember that scene in, the, in, the, in Chariots of Fire? When I run, Eric Lewis said, I can feel God's pleasure. Perhaps it's looking at the stars. Perhaps it's going to flowers. I don't know. But drawing close to God, I do know prayer, Bible study, church attendance, being a congregation together. That's how you build up those spiritual muscles. And then, once you've done that, once you've built up your spiritual muscle, once, you, once the Holy Spirit and the Lord enriches you and energizes you, you can't sit still. That's when you're motivated to go out and do the work of a Christian. Not being distracted, not being frustrated, not being burned out, doing the work of a Christian with joy. Joy in your heart. Christian work. Taking meals to people. Working at Habitat for Humanity. Going on mission trips. Volunteering at so many needful places. That isn't supposed to be work. That's supposed to be something that gives you joy and peace. But I put it before you today, to do that, you have to to just like Mary did, sit at the feet of our Lord, through worship and through all those means, and strengthen your spiritual muscles and your spiritual life to give you the strength you need to move forward. My old preaching professor, Dr. Tom Long tells a story about a Presbyterian youth group that went on a mission trip to Jamaica. And part of that mission trip was, you know, it was an educational kind of trip along with, I think they were going to do a Bible, uh, vacation Bible school and those kind of things. Uh, they went to a school to observe. And they went to a classroom, and the classroom was overcrowded. Just a huge amount of kids, and they were all misbehaving. They were bonkers. The class was chaos. And this young female teacher with love and patience dealt with it. Dealt with it person by person. And somehow, through all the chaos, there emerged some education going on. And, and the youth group and even the leader saying, look at her. She must simply love teaching. She's so dedicated. She just loves teaching. How wonderful. And so they tell her, you're doing a great job. You must love teaching. And she looks at them and she smiles. And she says, that's not quite true. I'm in that classroom not because I love teaching. I'm in the classroom because I love Jesus Christ. 
And it's Jesus Christ who gives me the strength to see in all those kids the spark of God. That's why I love to be in the classroom. That's what God calls us to do. One goes with the other. I suppose if you think about it, there could be something, perhaps there was in the gospel sometime, someone who was sitting at the feet of Jesus too long and not really getting up and doing something. But here we have an example of someone who was drawn away, too distracted, to sit at the feet of the Lord and be renewed and be refreshed. I think we put those two stories for us so that we can have a balance. It's always been my hope and prayer that worship is a time of rejuvenation for you. A time when you recharge your batteries a little bit, draw a little closer to God through your prayers and through our time together. And you go home and you continue that at home. But then the purpose of that is to become a good Samaritan, to become a, a Martha who's not distracted or drawn away. To become someone who in the great spirit of the deacons serves the Lord as they minister to others. Oh, dear friends at Williston, it takes both. You need your spiritual life. And you need your life where you engage others as a disciple of Christ. Both are needed. Both are necessary. So, how about it? I don't plan to get distracted again. And I hope you don't either. Amen. <coughs> Let's rise and reaffirm what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the Son of the Son of my Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered and brought his father, was crucified and made in the he descended in heaven.
ask in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>